Important Conversation, organized by the Afghanistan Policy Lab at Princeton University, School of Public and International Affairs. Today, we will be talking about the complexities of humanitarian situation in Afghanistan and discussing the possible ways to mitigate and address the situation that it can serve the people of Afghanistan the best. As we all know, Afghanistan has been facing severe crises ranging from an economic collapse, a humanitarian catastrophe, and the effects of natural and climate-linked disasters. It is a situation that has placed close to half of the population in the country in urgent need of humanitarian aid with many suffering from food insecurity. The situation worldwide also has affected this humanitarian emergency as crises elsewhere, including the situation in Ukraine, have stretched resources and humanitarian response capabilities very thin. This was further underscored last March when a high level pledging conference on supporting the humanitarian response in Afghanistan fell short of the 4.4 billion dollar being sought by the UN with only 2.44 billion being raised. The earthquake that hit Afghanistan last June that felt thousands of people dead and injured truly underscored the gravity of the situation in the country in the urgent need for humanitarian and development efforts to continue. However, the complexities of working and existing constraints in the country, in a collapsed banking system, and halt of economic development brings us today to the difficult question of how, how can we overcome the existing challenges in transition from a stopgap solution approach to a long-term planning that can identify and serve the needs of the Afghan people. Today, we have excellent panelists with rich experience from the policy side, as well as our hands-on practitioners who are directly engaged in the humanitarian response to Afghanistan. Although one could hold a series of panels with possible responses to this question, but we believe that the value of the expertise we have here can help us kickstart the brainstorming of a pragmatic and effective solution on addressing the humanitarian crises in Afghanistan. To facilitate this discussion, it's my great honor to introduce Dr. Orzala Neymat, an internationally renowned Afghan scholar with over 20 years of experience in humanitarian affairs and sustainable development. Dr. Neymat is holding a PhD in Development Studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies and MSc in Development Planning from the University of College London. We are pleased that she can join us today to moderate today's panel, as well as our great panelists who I'm greatly and extremely grateful for their participation and availability. And with this said, I would like to now give the floor to Dr. Neymat who will give us a brief overview of today's event before leading us into the conversation. Dr. Neymat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Raz. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good day, and good afternoon, or probably good evening to some of the audience. It's a great pleasure and honor to be today with you and having the honor of moderating a panel with such distinguished participants and panelists. I would like to thank also uh, the Afghanistan Policy Lab at the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs for organizing today's uh, high level panel in such timely manner, as we all understand that the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan is reaching to a point that definitely requires serious conversations that probably leads to better provision of services and more efficient ways of responding to a very urgent need to people. So um, today we are discussing how humanitarian and development activities in Afghanistan can transition from a stop uh, gap solu solutions approach into sustainable and long-term planning that can identify and serve the needs of the Afghan people while overcoming the existing challenges. To do so, I'll be guiding us through a conversation that brings together policy perspectives and work on the ground uh, uh, from Afghanistan. 
But before that, let me first introduce the distinguished panelists to you. Mr. Thomas uh, Nicholson, uh, the EU Special Envoy for Afghanistan, a well-versed uh, international civil servant with years of experiences working in different sections of the European External Action Service and the European Commission. Very welcome. Ms. Connie Wignaraja, UNDP's Special Secretary General Assistant Administrator and Director of the Regional Bureau of for Asia and the Pacific, uh, who brings a regional expertise coupled with an understanding uh, of the policy and strategic planning of the United Nations. It's a great honor and pleasure to have you, uh, Connie, with us in this panel, um, with the, uh, the importance that the UN have uh, today in Afghanistan. Uh, definitely the next panelist is uh, uh, Ms. Melinda Good, the World Bank Country Director, uh, for Afghanistan, who brings along with her extensive experience in the World Bank, a direct perspective from the ground through her current work as country director of Afghanistan. Very warm welcome to you as well, Ms. Good. And last but not least, Dr. Uh, Alisa Sharkey, lecturer at the School of Public and International Affairs and a senior health specialist of the Implementation Research and Delivery Science Unit and UNICEF Health Section in New York. She brings, Dr. Sharkey brings with her over 25 years of experience, including an acting regional health and um, health advisor and maternal uh, child head uh, uh, specialist in South Asia. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to have you, uh, Dr. Sharkey with us. So moving uh, directly to the, to, the, to the questions, I want to start with Mr. Nicholson. Over the past 20 years, the EU has invested countless resources on the development, protection, and promotion of the uh, rights for women and girls in the country. To the many gains uh, and achievements of the last 20 years, particularly in the field of uh, uh, women and girls' education and job and access to basic services, has been challenged by the current authorities or restricted, to be very specific. So. How can international community ensure that improving women and girls' rights situation remains as an essential element uh, in the process of delivering aid and assistance or humanitarian aid and assistance in Afghanistan? Um, Mr. Nicholson, the floor is yours. Thank you. First of all, thanks for, for having me in this panel. Uh, it is, unfortunately, I'm good, I was going to say extremely timely. Um, because we have, of course, the winter uh, uh, coming up again after, after I think we collectively somehow managed to better than, better than fear, at least, to, to help most Afghans get, get through the winter. Uh, but the situation, as, as you mentioned in, in the introduction, is, is far, from, uh, far from good um, with, with huge needs and also um, the, the pledges so far not, not covering in any way uh, the needs that we see uh, are already there and the needs coming up. Um, the systematic denial, of course, of, of, uh, of the rights of, of women and, and girls um, is, uh, is, is appalling. And uh, for the EU, these rights, human rights more broadly, of course, but also the rights of, of women and girls rem remain um, at the forefront of our policies. And also, uh, when it comes to our, our delivery of humanitarian assistance and um, our assistance also to cover basic needs and livelihoods. Um, we raise the issue uh, regularly in our dialogue with the Taliban. Uh, we underline the need when it comes to humanitarian assistance for women to be um, included in humanitarian needs assessment and in delivery. Um, and this is key uh, to assess the needs of all Afghans. Uh, we know that by including women, we can also ensure that needs of women and children, boys and girls, are actually assessed. And the same goes for the delivery of humanitarian assistance, where right from the start we have, um, we have emphasized the need for women to be, be included. Uh, it's a matter um, 
it's it's necessary in order to provide access um, to assistance, and it's of course also a way to to ensure that women um, <clears throat> have employment opportunities also in this sector. Um, some of the priority areas for the EU uh, humanitarian assistance over the past year have been health and nutrition and food assistance, where more than three million people with a special focus on children and women uh, receive food and nutritional support. And we also supported education in emergencies, which uh, contributed to over uh, close to four million children um, uh, having access to education through uh, community-based education and temporary learning spaces. We have, like other partners, suspended um, traditional development assistance to Afghanistan. Uh, we do not have a recognized government to work with. We do not have um, an entity that can enter into agreements with, with the EU uh, regarding development assistance. Um, and instead, we uh, have tried uh, to focus on uh, supporting uh, basic needs um, and, and um, uh, basic needs and livelihoods. Um, but not delivered through through the Taliban, but through through other organisations, primarily the UN. Um, the rights of women and, and girls were at the core of our decision making process when we decided uh, last autumn and over the winter where where this money money should go, where the support should go, um, and uh, what we refer to as basic need support and covers education, health, wash, and nutrition. Uh, livelihoods and access to food. Some concrete examples, um, emergency cash support for close to 200,000 teachers during the winter months. Uh, we were hoping at the time, of course, that this should allow schools to open not only primary education, but also secondary education, as indeed the Taliban had promised. Uh, they didn't deliver. Uh, some would consider our assistance a failure. Uh, because schools didn't open. I don't see it that way. I'm, of course, extremely disappointed. More importantly, many Afghans are disappointed that schools didn't open. But at least we did what we could to keep, to keep teachers, um, honestly speaking, alive and present. And uh, we are hoping, of course, that this will uh, eventually and soon allow schools to open. We also provided cash for work in the agricultural sector and income generating activities for women. And uh, one example is a program where we provide uh, 23,000 uh, Afghan entrepreneurs, uh, and the majority of them uh, in this program are women, to help them um, deliver uh, their businesses, de develop and expand their businesses. This, of course, as we know, it may sound like a drop in the ocean, um, but if you take 23,000 Afghan women and you multiply by whatever number of family members, parents or husbands or children, and if you also then add a number of employees per, per company, you actually come up to a, a, meaningful, uh, a meaningful figure. It's never enough, and that's, of course, still remains a basic problem. It isn't enough. Um, but we hope uh, that by working both through policy dialogue where possible, through humanitarian assistance and the alternative to development assistance for the moment, basic needs and livelihoods, we can contribute to, to keep these issues um, on the agenda. I don't think I can say that we can assure, we cannot, and we are not alone in this, of course, but this is the, the way we, we try to contribute to that at least. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Nicholson, for a very uh, detailed and comprehensive response, really. Um, as we all understand, the need is enormous, but the most important point is to fulfill our collective responsibility, whether international community, different institutions, or Afghans themselves within the civil society and so forth. We are, are well aware of the enormous challenges, but it's uh, very good to hear from you about the different forms of interventions that uh, the EU is uh, involved in. And now moving to um, uh, the UN uh, perspective to you, uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Kani, or if I may say your uh, last name, Ms. Uh, uh, Wigner Raja. 
Uh, so the United Nations operation in the country can be a vast and wide area of agencies, adding a very complex dynamic to the work on the ground. We all uh, know it very well. So one, I'm sure you're asked on sort of frequent uh, sort of occasions, this question of how UN is effectively coordinating uh, its efforts uh, in this area. And also how would UN define uh, its mechanism for accountability in order to avoid potential uh, misallocation or mismanagement of humanitarian assistance at this time to ensure that aid and assistance is reaching uh, the neediest first. We all are well aware that at the moment, the major channel of humanitarian assistance uh, distribution is through the UN agencies. So um, we are hoping to hear more from you about this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Namat. And let me uh, start by by saying that uh, it is a, a large group of us in uh, in Afghanistan, and we stayed through uh, through the entire period. Um, and uh, yes, I mean it's not uh, just about the UN. Uh, it's a large network of of local and international uh, NGOs and partners who are in this uh, together uh, with us and. And thank goodness for that network, uh, because I think together we now we cover all of Afghanistan, uh, even more uh, parts of the country than we were in before. So it is quite a significant uh, coverage uh, geographically and uh, thematically um, has been um, quite a, a lift. And as, as Thomas said, uh, the the worry was heading into that first uh, winter. Um, and I, I do think that at that time, from August through about um, uh, February, March of this year, it had to be a massive relief operation. And um, we moved to direct delivery so that we were working directly with uh, communities in uh, in um, providing all of that assistance uh, immediately. Um, and it was a, a, a for a number of the UN agencies, including UNDP, a, a real turnaround from having worked uh, with a number of state institutions that we had been supporting to build up over the last 20 years. Um, and that um, within a month, uh, we had to shift out of, of working through state institutions uh, and government uh, mechanisms to working directly with community. Now, the good thing is that we had had that experience of doing this before. So this was not a, a completely new uh, phenomenon. We just thought we were done with that and that we were now supporting the rebuilding of, of a state. Um, but uh, we have to remember a few facts. First is that the economy of Afghanistan is a relatively small one, right? So if you look at uh, 40 million people um, at the time uh, last year, um, it was a similar population, let's say, to Poland. But Afghanistan had a, a, a 20 billion um, uh, sized economy and, and Poland is 720 billion, right? So you can see the, the size difference. And then the majority of that uh, was still driven by ODA and international assistance with over 20 years. Now we've got to really think about that. Um, so yes, we put in place all of the, the direct interventions. We follow the money A to, A to Z all the way to the end beneficiary. And uh, in that sense, it's, it's uh, really hats off to the, the whole UN team that has come together uh, to do that. And, and I am um, extremely uh, proud and comfortable with the way uh, the the accountability for the the money we are receiving uh, from our, our donor partners uh, is being delivered right now, and and the huge accountability and risk taking also by our NGO partners. But this just isn't going to do it. I think we've got to ask harder questions, and haven't we learned from the last twenty years uh, that running an economy? through international assistance just doesn't cut it. Um, so the question to me is, 
how do we grow back uh, the domestic private sector? Uh, it's local markets. I mean, uh, Adela knows this well. Afghans have always fed Afghans. Um, you know, this is a sense of building back uh, the, the domestic structures so communities can regain their foothold on their own economy. Um, and that to me is where it's at. The local financing and domestic banking system has to get back. We saw GDP contract by an unprecedented 20% in the, just the first six months. Uh, Melinda and, and the World Bank know this well. Um, and we are, we are seeing 90% universal poverty. But if we think that we can address this again and again through international aid alone, uh, that should be a catalyst. I would like to see the equation turn on its head, which is that we are there as an additional catalyst and not as the centerpiece of trying to put back uh, the parts of an economy that have to uh, revive. And to me, that's about supporting farmers, uh, uh, supporting local food chains, uh, bringing back uh, local institutions, uh, including the local financing system, uh, to really uh, get that revival truly homegrown. And we play a support role and not the primary role uh, in, uh, in this country as in any country. Uh, back to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Vignaraja. Uh, you've made absolutely remarkable points, especially starting with the fact that we have to learn from our experiences. I think Afghanistan in itself, and I say that with courage as a development expert, that is a ground field of learning lessons because uh, uh, the financial, the lack of sustainability, whether financially in the development field or others, probably comes back to all of us and in our practices over the past two decades. So it is a great opportunity while immediate response to the starvation for to the malnutrition and food secure insecurity, all of this is more important and people should not suffer. We, we really hope that there are spaces for learning and how to sort of get this level of extreme level of dependency over with. So now, uh, speaking of the, uh, uh, the getting over with uh, from dependency, um, we are moving to the World Bank. Um, I want to now move to some perspective in the field, specifically um, to to uh, to to you, Miss uh, Good. Uh, it's great pleasure having you with us. Um, we would like to know what is the current uh, footprint of the World Bank in Afghanistan. We know historically that in the last two decades. Uh, World Bank had an remarkable role in terms of the community development and some institutions uh, and some services that it provided uh, have been remarkable. But the question is that, is there uh, a space to continue working towards more longer term sustainability um, in terms of uh, economic and uh, as well as uh, development in the financial uh, stability, uh, particularly in the current uh, context with limitations, with sanctions in place, in all of the challenges that uh, have been discussed about. Thanks, Dr. Nimat, and thanks, Thomas and uh, Kani as well. Um, our, co our comments flow very well together, which doesn't surprise me because we've all been working so closely together over the last year. So, you know, as I look back uh, about a year ago to the structure of the economy and then what we're dealing with now, as we try to answer this question that you put, right? You know, before aid flows averaged 60% of GDP, and for sure over the last 20 years, we saw significant development impacts that really brought Afghanistan up from sort of the bottom of the group, up to about where it would be in development impacts for an economy of its size, uh, which was not a huge economy, but it was one that was growing. Now, the challenge as we look back is that these large aid, aid flows did not really result in significant productive investments. A lot of it was in the services sectors that meant growth in, in cities, um, but it meant also that benefits were not widely distributed. And there was a lot of growth, but not as significant reduction in poverty. So I just came back from Kabul, I, I go in and out, and it was clear, you know, it's clear that the events of the last year resulted in an economic crisis, a humanitarian emergency, and also real financial sector paralysis 
that's stopping the private sector, that's stopping the humanitarian agencies, that's stopping the development agencies from really having a significant impact. And already it was one of the 10 poorest countries in the world. So now uh, if we take what we've seen, which is a reduction of the economy by between 20 and 30%, probably closer to 30% as we go into 2022, for sure we're looking at a smaller and poorer economy. The crisis that we were worrying about last winter was averted for last winter, you know, largely thanks to the work of the NGOs, the humanitarian agencies, WFP, I know Mel couldn't be here, uh, the work of Connie and her colleagues. And, you know, we're reaching kind of a lower level of equilibrium. The data that we're getting is showing that this rapid decline that we saw is unlikely to be as rapid, but it's not good. It's not reaching any level of sustainability for people um, in the short term much less in the medium term. So we really have to think differently about how we support the Afghan people. Now, over the last year, um, there's been a tremendous effort to put, uh, to put resources not only into the immediate humanitarian response, but as Connie and Tomas were saying, also to work towards basic services, towards livelihoods. And so from the World Bank side, we have the Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund, which released about a billion dollars for these efforts. Now, how does that get to your question about communities. If we think about what to do in a situation where aid is moving um, off budget, right? The on budget aid had always been a much smaller percentage than the off budget anyway, but where we were building institutions, whether it was the EU or the UN or the World Bank uh, financing flows, where, where do we see some of that sustainability? And it really is looking at some of the local level institutions, which are continuing to deliver services. A lot of the institutions that you know as well, Dr. Neman, right, who are on the ground delivering health services, the community development councils that, that uh, we're working with with UN agencies, they're continuing to deliver services. So there is some institutional core that's there. The private sector as well, um, in the initial survey of firms that we did last fall, about 60% had reported that they'd laid off more than half of their staff. That also seems to be leveling out a little bit. And when I was last in Kabul uh, meeting with businesses, um, both medium-sized and larger firms with the Women's Chamber of Commerce, with others, um, you know, some are beginning to be able to hire people back. People are adapting, but that doesn't mean that they're, that they're growing. So if we start to think about, you know, how does aid become effective for this situation over the coming years? Uh, we've, we've done a couple of models, economic modeling, to begin to think about where if, you, if as financing comes in, there's the emergency response, which absolutely will have to continue this winter after the earthquake, with the floods, uh, with the winter we see coming. Then for the other types of financing, where can it have the biggest impact? Now, we're estimating that between one and $2 billion came in for these sectors last year. If you take that together with the amount of revenue that we're hearing was reported to be collected, um, that sort of financing probably could sustain, kind of stop this downward trajectory, but it won't get us to the kind of sustainability of an economy that doesn't rely on those level of aid flows, which we saw in the past, which simply are unlikely to be able to be continued. Um, to have any sort of growth, it really will re require um, support to these firms, um, small businesses in the rural areas, as well as in the urban areas. Um, and then, you know, looking at a sort of investment level of about double to triple what we had last year, which is still a lot less than before, um, you could see growth and recovery over the next decade. But this is not a given, right? There's a lot of factors, including factors with the decision makers on the ground in Kabul that could facilitate this. Um, and so really it, it is at that decision point, I think as all of the partners are, are determining where they can make the biggest impact with, with less. So let me just, let me just stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Good. Uh, definitely, um, uh, this is uh, great to hear that World Bank is thinking of longer, longer term sustainability of uh, more sort of effective provision of services to the to the people. As this is a concern we are realizing. Um, just listening to your talks, I was just thinking 
God forbid, if we have the same kind of departure of donors as we had last year with the military presence in Afghanistan, then the country will be in real, real problem. But I'm confident that's not going to happen. Uh, um, what is really important for, particularly for the Afghan partners, is to really seriously and responsibly think of more sustainable ways of working. Uh, your efforts and the efforts of institutions working on financial stability and trying to sort of enforce or empower the local uh, uh, businesses, small and medium size, particularly, but also larger size is, is really uh, important. And uh, now we are moving the conversation to the responses uh, side. Um, and coming to you, uh, Dr. Sharkey, uh, in terms of uh, 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 this question that what would you see uh, as some of the biggest challenges that faces humanitarian responses of today based on your observations and your practices um, what do you think are the key uh, challenges uh, in responses uh, in humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan perhaps thinking of some of your experiences in the health sector and uh, just before uh, you you continue um, I draw the attention of most of uh, uh, you to, to the very depressing report we received today from the uh, Badakhshan or about the food uh, insecurity that is leading to malnutrition and the miscarriages of women and the unborn children. So this is a very sort of uh, challenging situation that probably will spread further. So uh, looking forward to hear from you and your perspective in terms of the challenges and issues. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Demet, and um, also to the other, well, to the organizers for inviting me and also to the fellow presenters for um, some of their really interesting insights. And, and it's great to hear what's happening also across the organizations. Um, and I think I wanted to start by saying what others have noted, you know, the, the situation is so complex in Afghanistan, and of course, it's protracted. Um, and it continues to be dynamic as, as what we saw last week with the events in Kabul. Um, and unfortunately, this current crisis in Afghanistan is happening within an extremely challenging situation globally. Um, just yesterday, I was reading about um, an estimated, I think 900,000 people in the Sahel in Western Africa are at extreme risk due the, to the drought there. Um, you know, that we, we do have multiple crises going on globally. Um, I believe the latest estimates are that there are about 100 million um, forcibly displaced people in the world. And it's important to note that this is more than double what was estimated about a, a decade ago. Um, and of course, more than just being forcibly displaced, we have many more people who are just exposed to war and conflict. And of course, uh, working with UNICEF, you know, our, our big concern is with women and children and, and kind of the impacts that this has on some of the most vulnerable um, people within those communities. Um, so just to say that the, you know, the need for humanitarian um, efforts, it's, it's intense. Um, and it's also occurring within a time that our humanitarian systems are un underfunded, they're overstretched, uh, they're overwhelmed, and we do often see poor coordination um, between the actors. Um, and uh, unfortunately, if we look at some of the mega trends predicted for the future, um, including due to the aftermath of the pandemic, um, food price crisis now due to the war in Ukraine, uh, threat of a global recession, and not to mention all of the climate change attributable um, displacement, conflict, food insecurity that will come with that. Um, so we can imagine that the importance of these humanitarian efforts are only going to grow. So I think this is one really huge challenge that the sector has. Um, another is that funding for humanitarian responses is overwhelmingly um, reactive short term, um, and it really does thus um, sort of severely curtail uh, emergency preparedness, needs-based early responses, donor fatigue can also be an important challenge um, in the sector. And then, you know, this can affect even essential services um, that are part of humanitarian responses. Um, and some of the, um, so dealing in some of these more complicated uh, situations, such as Afghanistan, there are often restrictive measures um, and compliance 
um, issues that are established at the broader sort of more political level that can also make the job of our, our technical humanitarian actors difficult um, and can add extra layers of costs and effort into the work that's happening on the ground. Um, so that can actually absorb some of the funding, um, even though the, these are life-saving programs that, that, are, that are often being implemented. Um, but on a related note, um, you know, the UN responses that often have to work through governments can be a challenge in many of these settings. So we see, for example, as has happened in Afghanistan over the years, um, that uh, funding may go to the non-governmental partners, like such as the um, International Committee for the Red Cross, um, which can work quite well. I think Thomas mentioned that that's what the EU is doing now. Uh, oh no, working through the UN, he said. Um, but but sometimes working through these other partners. Um, and of course, the bigger challenge, which I think both um, Melinda and Connie alluded to, there, there are these challenges, of course, then with respect to sustainability and how do we make, how do we um, sort of invest in the structures that we know can, can last for a long time. So, um, but another important point to make, I think, is that um, the local um, organizations who are working on the ground um, are sometimes those who are the, most well placed um, to know uh, what is needed in those um, in those communities, but they can really sometimes have challenges competing for the funding. Um, and further, you know, just uh, the beneficiaries themselves are are often disempowered in these in these types of situations and rarely listened to. And this is in spite of the fact that we know how important it is to ensure that program design and implementation appropriately reflect the local realities and needs. Um, so I think um, these are all really important challenges. Um, maybe one final challenge um, that's not uh, necessarily posed by the international community is, is when local authorities themselves um, try to position uh, their own NGOs or networks as implementers. Um, if they have the capacity to handle this, this can work. Um, but if not, this can create really difficult situations. And I think for the international community and donors in particular, it's really hard sometimes to assess the local capacity of these actors with respect to their technical capacity, um, fiduciary reporting, you know, all these things that donors need um, the implementers to have. So uh, that paints a bit of a grim picture, but maybe I'll maybe I'll stop there. There, there are many challenges, um, not just with the work itself, but given the broader global um, situation that we're now we now find ourselves in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharkey. Really, uh, you've uh, uh, brought the conversation to an important aspect because when looking at the uh, challenges in Afghanistan over the last year, we've witnessed how prioritization in terms of the international community's responses change because of the needs. Uh, other conflicts emerge and as a result, uh, things uh, um, get more attention on other parts, whether it is man-made disasters or uh, uh, natural disasters. Uh, and we know that in terms of climate also, there are quite severe level of uh, uh, crises emerging from one part or other parts of the world. So in light of that, I'm going back uh, one more round uh, to the res uh, respected panelists. But before doing so, uh, I would like to um, invite uh, all participants, uh, the, uh, the those who are uh, signed in through Zoom, to type in their questions in the Q&A box uh, if you have any questions. Uh, or later on, uh, when the time comes, I'll ask you to raise your hands in case you have a question. We try our best if technology allows us to directly let you the opportunity to ask a question. So um, in terms of the second round, um, in light of the conversation we had, uh, uh, Mr. Nicholson, um, I'd like to ask you in terms of how should aid policymakers or donor countries uh, sequence the current challenge uh, challenges, particularly in terms of rescuing uh, basically a weak economy or continuing the restrictions. So on the one side, the diplomatic relations, on the other side, providing services and uh, providing support for the basic humanitarian aid. So how do you see this being balanced as we move forward? 
I don't think it is an either or. Um, I think, um, as you mentioned, uh, several of, of the colleagues mentioned, humanitarian assistance will continue to be needed. Um, but we also, of course, need to look for ways we, in a, in a large sense, uh, the organizations represented here, but, uh, but also, of course, the de facto authorities, those who, who claim to be in control and claim to have a responsibility in the country, also need to look for ways for, for long-term long -term development and reviving the economy. Um, of course, uh, when we speak to the Taliban, the issue of, of frozen reserves and frozen assets come up. Um, but we also see on the, on the side of the, of the de facto the restriction of, of uh, women working uh, in the country uh, actually uh, deprives um, more than 50% uh, of, the, of the population uh, an opportunity to contribute to the economy. Now, it would be a cheap point to say that it reduces by 50%. It doesn't, because, of course, not all Afghan women were, were working until a year ago. But it, 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 uh, it deprives a lot, of, a lot of Afghan women the chance to, to contribute. Uh, and it, uh, it, is, um, it is something that is entirely in the hands of the, of the de facto authorities. Um, the question on the economy, uh, we also hear a lot, of course, of the effect of sanctions. Uh, just to set the record straight from my point of view, no new sanctions have been imposed on Afghanistan, on the Taliban as a movement or on individual Taliban since they um, took power a year ago. Uh, it is not the choice of, of the UN, of the EU, of international organization of partners to put listed uh, terrorists uh, in, in uh, positions where they have, are in charge of, of organizations and entities such as the central bank. Um, so it is, um, it is uh, to address the, economic, the fundamental economic issues at macro level, there is a, a major role for the, for the de facto authorities, for the Taliban to play as well. Um, I then very much agree with what I heard. There is a need to rethink. There is a need, I think, for all of us uh, to rethink what, and most of all for Afghans to rethink how, uh, how the Afghan economy should, uh, should work uh, one year, five years, 10 years from now. Um, the model um, very much dependent on, on, on donor money, um, <clears throat> uh, on serving also to some extent uh, the military presence, um, which was an important, um, which kept a lot of Afghans busy in many ways to provide services and, and goods to, to that, to that uh, <clears throat> operation. Uh, is not uh, well it's not sustainable it's not ideal what what should it look like um but then i think to to me and you know, i i mean i would like to offer solutions rather than adding adding difficulties and problems but but one one thing that crossed my mind um one of you mentioned the the uh, sustainability which which of course we always uh, think of as important but how how do we work on a sustainable economic model when at least some of us may not think that the political model is not sustainable. Can you really separate the two? Uh, can you work on a sustainable economy that would work regardless of uh, what political system or model will be in place a number of years from now? Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Nicholson. Um, definitely important to note uh, the recommendations or suggestions that you've made. Um, now, um, relevant to this matter uh, is going back to the development and UN. Um, we are coming back to you, uh, uh, Ms. Wignaraja. Um, uh, before the changes last year, Afghanistan already struggled with the implementation of the um, uh, you know, ensuring that the sustainable development goals are uh, achieved. Given the looming uh, funding gap and other contextual limitations and restrictions, is this still on the table? And is there uh, still a discussion about how um, uh, Afghanistan will meet the, uh, the, the, the fulfillment of uh, or actually achieve uh, any of these uh, SDGs? Indeed, I think, you know, you can't take the SDGs off the table. They have to remain our North Star. 
because otherwise, um, you know, yes, Afghanistan was already one of the, the 10 poorest countries, as, as Melinda, Melinda said. But also, as, as Thomas and, and Alyssa just said, uh, you know, you can't lose hope, right? You've got to keep um, pushing forward. And to do that, you need a set of aspirational goals. So yes, by, you know, it's, it's, there are a number of those goals um, that won't be met uh, by Afghanistan. They won't be met by a number of countries now because of the huge setbacks uh, globally that have been faced, not just because of COVID, but because of a war and uh, the resulting kind of food crisis and energy crisis. But I think we've got to keep them in sight because if not, uh, and you lose hope and you lose um, all sense of investing in a in a country's institutions and in a country's people, uh, I think then we just got to all pack our bags and go home or just not get out of bed. So to me, it's very important to keep them in sight. And there are a few that are priorities. So for me, the, the fact that there are, uh, we are working uh, with 50,000 uh, small and micro uh, businesses uh, that's the, the goal for, for this year. And we've reached um, about a quarter of them. Um, many of them are women-led because the informal sector, the formal informal sector, the legal informal sector, very much uh, run by women, as in many countries. Uh, and uh, investing in them as a huge payoff uh, and, and keeps uh, livelihoods going. So you can't keep lives going without keeping livelihoods going. Uh, if you if you believe in a in a model that's not pure dependency from the outside, and I think that's a huge piece of of moving uh, jobs and and cash back into the economy. And I'm a strong believer that when you give um, uh, locally in communities, uh, when you have cash. Uh, whether uh, for work, you make the right choices on uh, heading into uh, healthcare, into schooling, uh, you put it into um, farming. Uh, it's, Afghanistan's always been a very decentralized economy. Um, and to, to, you know, it's not a large national economy that has driven this country uh, over decades. So growing back uh, that local, those local economies, the multiple local economies, um, I think is, is a critical part of where the SDGs uh, take us. So I would say uh, it's more localized SDGs. Uh, I'm not looking for national averages. Um, and it is true that, and the worry is, as Melinda said, is the numbers are showing that we're working at a more depressed level of overall resources and flows. But I, I am very uh, hopeful that by growing the local economies back, that there is that groundswell. Uh, so it's a bottom-up uh, approach of saying, uh, is there a way to put back investments in local systems of water, of energy, of healthcare, uh, of schools, of jobs, um, and that way bring back through local SDGs a sense of, of life and livelihoods uh, for this country. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Vigna Raja. Um, I definitely like this point in terms of keep, uh, we cannot afford going away from the SDGs. Um, and uh, probably uh, reminding uh, some of the audience and distinguished panelists that um, uh, for a moment, if I wear my uh, leading uh, Afghanistan research and evaluation hat, we have been working very closely uh, in terms of integrating uh, the, the, the achievability of the SDGs through different you know, fields, uh, ensuring that whether what are the issues in the health sector and the education and in other parts in agriculture, environment, water, uh, to sort of address these. So, one probably one call over different institutions is to ensure that the SDGs that are agreed by UN and UN member states are addressed even during the responses to the humanitarian assistance. 
um, I think that uh, that's an important point to be made uh, here. Uh, thank you again uh, for your uh, points. Um, and now moving back to um, uh, to the field and specifically in terms of longer term uh, development, uh, Miss Good, uh, I wanted to hear from you more about the way forward in terms of the World Bank's um, engagement, um, particularly under the um, uh, community-driven development uh, programs uh, that we know World Bank has a commitment all across the world. So, uh, because this is an area that uh, the World Bank has been engaged in for over two decades and with some remarkable uh, achievements uh, over these past two decades. So are there any specific plans uh, for the uh, different forms or the similar forms uh, of the CDD in the country uh, in the foreseeable future? So thanks, Dr. Nima. No, you're right. And this kind of brings us back to what is happening now and what can be done in the future. So for the World Bank financing right now, because we're working off budget with the ARTF partners, the financing is going largely through the UN agencies, international NGOs, and local NGOs. So that's sort of the way the financing is flowing. But then where is it being most effectively implemented? And here exactly, it's the CDCs, it's the health NGOs who were on the ground and quite frankly, were operating all across the country. For years, these operations were taking place in areas that were not controlled by the Republic, right? And it was the local communities who were saying, uh, these are our priorities, this is what we want, and we're negotiating to have that happen. And from what I'm hearing, both when I'm in Kabul and when I'm speaking with NGOs and with the UN agency partners, that's still happening. So continuing, excuse me, to finance in a fairly significant way, the livelihoods programs to the Community Development Council, that's ongoing. So from the ARTF financing, about uh, a quarter of what we've released has been uh, in that direction, right, to the CDC programs um, working uh, through the UN and alongside the UN as well as with NGOs. And the same is with health, right? And I think together with partners within this rubric of um, the basic services also looking to address water issues in the same way through these local institutions. I mean, this is where, these were institutions that everybody supported, everybody who's connected to the call supported for years. And it's possible because they operate at the community level to continue to, um, to, continue to support them. An important point about this is how we coordinate differently now. And there is um, uh, agreed sort of a new aid architecture for Afghanistan, right? Where it's very clear coordination between different funding streams, whether it's the funding that's going directly to the UN, the funding that's coming out of the ARTF, the bilateral funding, Islamic Development Bank has, has a funding uh, pot, as well as the uh, Asian Development Bank. And so there's a real effort actually among these partners to report to make sure that if they're to make sure that everybody's kind of pushing in the same direction and that's particularly important with the community development councils um and so we're we're working very closely with connie's colleagues actually um on the ground on this so that we can continue to do that now, regardless of where the, the funding is coming coming from so uh, that's really important going forward i think that's Building these institutions will be one of the perhaps two or three things where if we look back five years from now, have we been able to inject sustainability into the system regardless of what happens at the political level. To move on to a recovery path is going to take some bridge towards some ability to have kind of policy dialogue in that direction, right? But if that doesn't happen, what can we do to sustain communities um, is one key piece. And the other really important piece that we don't have time to go into a lot of detail tonight is the financial sector. I mean, right now, all of this is happening through very limited bank transfers and quite frankly, through cash. So UNAMA brings in about, uh, brought in about a billion dollars in cash, right? And so this is how, how NGOs were getting paid. And that's great. And it actually helped some of this leveling off of the decline that I was talking about. But these correspondent banking relationships that were disrupted continue to make it really difficult to get on anything closer to a more sustainable pathway, including for those NGOs that are, um, and those NGOs working with the communities, right? Who have really quite restricted access to cash, even under the best design cash for work programs. They're not at kind of the, 
natural rolling progress that they were before. Not a surprise, but something everyone I think is trying to work to work on. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Melinda, for very important points that you've made in terms of, you know, um, way forward and what are the most important uh, areas for collaboration, but also areas for specifically strengthening uh, uh, the institutions on which uh, over two decades of investment has been made, the human resources investment, uh, and also financially uh, and technical investment uh, that we see. And based on the observations that we have from the ground also, uh, like you mentioned, both in the health sector and, uh, and the overall community development uh, area or uh, basically local uh, structures are um, active. And the important is to build upon these rather than try to sort of uh, cross them over or uh, establish new institutions. So it's really important to hear these uh, from, from you uh, in this conversation. So we are getting closer to almost uh, final part, but just before that, uh, one more chance to, um, to ask you, uh, Dr. Sharkey, in, in terms of prioritization. Um, if, uh, if you had picked one priority to focus from a technical standpoint with respect to the current uh, situation of Afghanistan, what would it be uh, at the moment? Listening to the conversation and observing the overall situation, if you could give us that, and then we move to the Q&A briefly. Great, thank, thank you, Dr. Dimat. I think I would um, build off of, I really liked the way Connie, um, talked about the, the localization and the, the important, you know, how just how decentralized Afghanistan is. Um, and so from a technical standpoint, um, if I had to choose one thing to prioritize, um, I would argue for the need for um, policy and program relevant implementation research uh, that can inform what is most critical, what is most needed in, in these local settings, um, particularly the most disadvantaged settings within the country. Um, so that means, you know, we need timely evidence that informs the priority questions that are um, being asked by people on the ground. We need to understand the local contexts, the local coping dynamics, their local priorities, for example, um, from the health perspective, is it water and sanitation? Is it primary health care services? Is it food, um, other nutrition needs, et cetera? Um, but also to have a mapping of the, the broader socio-political domains within these communities. Who's really in charge? Who are the influencers? Um, what existing technologies and resources might be there that we could build on, that we could use as opportunities? Um, um, but also just to document what works well and what doesn't work well in each setting. Um, and I think overall, the focus should really be on what the community needs uh, more broadly. And, and We've always struggled, I think, within um, global development to work across sectors, you know, to be more holistic. And I think um, that just obviously needs to uh, be a priority in these communities where we know they're not going to just need health services. They're going to need education. They're going to need a whole range of things, um, you know, in those communities. So, so from a technical standpoint, I guess I would say implementation research, documentation will be critical. Um, but also just this integrated community health focused approach um, rather than vertical um, programming. So, um, you know, to support that kind of work, I think the donors need to be more flexible to support this kind of localized programming. But I do think we need good information about what's really, uh, what's really needed and wanted in those communities. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharkey. Really important work. And uh, maybe for a moment, you, uh, exploiting my uh, role as a moderator, uh, wearing a researcher's hat, say that how important it is really the point you're making regarding uh, a continuous uh, data collection, continuous study and research. Uh, and one general message uh, for, uh, as a researcher that I would like to communicate on this panel and through this panel to audience is that research uh, and assessments take time. It's not a matter of one week, two weeks, three weeks, or even six weeks assignments that sometimes we receive 
uh, as researchers from the institution. So the analysis process requires and deserves enough time in order to give a very sort of more accurate and more close to reality, uh, reality assessment of the situation that should contribute to um, you know, program and uh, policy making process. Uh, at least I myself and my institution are committed and I'm sure there are many others already on the ground and trying to contribute in this way uh, to this enormous challenge, address these enormous challenges that we are facing. So um, I think we are getting closer to the end of the session. Um, I'm seeing that I'm sure all the respected uh, panelists are also uh, seeing different uh, questions being answered. In the interest of time, what I'll do is to probably pick on a couple of questions as we may not be able to answer all of them uh, and invite any any one of the distinguished panelists to to answer uh, uh, as they may see uh, uh, the question relevant to themselves. So one question is about what level of cooperation are the Taliban uh, providing for the delivery of aid and assistance? Um, uh, this is from Stephen Brown uh, and uh, I don't know which one of the panelists are willing to sort of um, jump in and respond to this question. Please feel free. Well, maybe I can start. Oh, Connie, you wanted to go? <laughs> well, just uh, maybe very quickly to, to Stephen, uh, to uh, who I know well, uh, to say that uh, in terms of our access to all parts of the country, that has been um, quite, uh, quite astounding, the level of, um, cooperation and access, um, but it's it's very important uh, that these are then seen at the local level because that's where it's the provincial governors uh, and uh, who provide the security and the safety for our colleagues to be working, including all our NGO colleagues. Uh, but as I said, it's the first time ever we have access to the whole country um, and um, even in very remote locations. Uh, so that cooperation is assured. The question then is uh, cooperation on some of these big policy levers uh, and changes that are needed at the national level. And that is less forthcoming because obviously there's differences of opinion uh, on this. And, and if uh, you ask me what my primary um, priority would be, if I had just $1 left, I would put it in girls' education. And that's a tough one. Uh, but we've got to keep uh, the, the foot on the gas on that and just not let that go. Uh, because any future of any country is dependent on the space and the rights and the access provided to girls and women. To me, that is the standard bearer of the health of a country and its society and its uh, political and economic space. Uh, so that's where I would put my money. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Ms. Shockey, you wanted to, to, to come after? I think Annie's answer is great and she um, is uh, more up to speed on what's currently the situation there. I was going to say that even over the past decade or so, there've been local examples where um, groups have been working with um, whoever's in charge, Taliban. Otherwise, this is not just true in Afghanistan. It's true in Nigeria with Boko Haram. It's true in Somalia with Al Shabaab. I mean, there are there are people who know um, how to work with with these non-state actors, and so um, you know, in a lot of local settings, people want um, the leaders do want their people to get basic health health services, for example, and and other things they need. So um, I think what we've seen now is that there's there's uh, there's a there's not a one consensus. I think across everyone in that in the country about about um, what people should have access to. So that's that's back to Connie's point about at the national level, there needs to be some work in, in getting everybody on the right, on the same page. Thanks, over. Thank you very much. Um, so one last question is one of the fellows from the Afghan Policy Lab, uh, Ms. Uh, MP Nahid Farid. How uh, the international community could assure that aid will not uh, go into the hands of Taliban which uh, could be used for political purposes versus directly to the people who are in need. Um, what sort of assurances could be given there? Probably we can ask this, probably uh, uh, Ambassador Nicholson, uh, you may come in uh, to address this question. 
mechanisms of assurance that the aid reaches the people themselves and bypassing the those who are in power. Well, I think when it comes to humanitarian assistance, it is it is uh, not a new challenge. Um, we were already uh, during the Islamic Republic. I think about seventy percent of of the assistance went uh, went to areas outside uh, government control. So, I mean, we are. I mean, the good the good thing is that uh, and to come back to what what Kani said, I think we have. Um, in many places in Afghanistan, there is a good understanding among many Taliban what, what humanitarian assistance should be and, uh, and some basic principles uh, for how it should be delivered. Um, our way of, of assuring uh, that it doesn't get diverted is precisely by working, working through trusted partners um, who in turn work with local communities. Um, when it comes to the other forms of assistance uh, to cover uh, or address basic basic needs and livelihoods, again, the starting point is, is that we, we do not work through the Taliban, the money is not challenged through, through the budget or through, uh, through the de facto authorities. Um, and we have people on the ground and we work with organizations on the ground. So I think that's the, that's the relatively short answer in uh, how we can be reasonably uh, assured that uh, the vast majority of the money reaches the people it should. Thank you so much, Ambassador Nicholson. Uh, thank you all distinguished panelists. This has been a great honor and pleasure um, having this conversation with all of you. And uh, also I'd like to uh, once again, thank the Afghanistan Policy Lab in uh, Ambassador Adela John Ross uh, for organizing this panel together with her um, team. Um, in order to close this, uh, I would like to um, ask Dr. Sharkey to summarize the conversation before we move to the end of the session. Thank you very much for your attention. It's been a great pleasure being with all of you. Well, thank you so much. I am going to try to raise the, there were so many really interesting points raised and I was trying to take notes while people were talking just to pull together some of those quickly, but um, but I think, you know, in summary, we talked a lot about the complexity of the current situation and the urgency given the current needs um, that exist and what we anticipate will be happening with the winter coming up, um, of course, the, and the pledging conference falling short. Um, I think Tomas talked a lot about how um, the EU has really had a tremend tremendous investments in a wide range of, of life-saving interventions that they're delivering through the UN largely. Um, Pani talked also about the large um, coverage that they have both geographically and thematically um, at UNDP um, and how they, they've really shifted their work um, to work more directly with uh, communities. Um, and it, it also sounds like from both Tomas and Connie, there have been important efforts to try to improve accountability. Um, but then um, also talking about the difficulty, um, you know, how, how to think about more of the sustainable um, structures and institutions and some of the innovative approaches that are being used, for example, micro businesses, particularly that are women led, um, thinking about how to grow back the domestic private markets um, and how the, the focus cannot really be on international aid alone. Um, so I think an one important point I, I raised in my earlier comment was I really liked her, her comment about um, the need to focus on, on what's locally important um, and, and if, at all times keeping the SDGs as our North Star. You know, human rights need to be paramount in all of our work. Um, Melinda talked also about um, the important way the, the World Bank is, is, um, is in, in the past, uh, um, we saw that a lot of aid flow went directly to cities. So there were some equity issues over the past 20 years, um, not, not just from the World Bank, but broadly within the, the international um, aid sector. And as a result, there weren't these huge reductions in poverty. Um, and now what we've seen is this huge contraction in the economy, but the way that the World Bank is focusing on livelihoods, try, again, trying to ensure sustainability through the local institutions. And um, I think that this is a really innovative, important way to work in the, in the current challenging context. Um, um, and so 
I would say just in summary, it's clear there has been a lot of really high level thinking about how the international organizations need to approach these settings and, and work with actors. And a lot of that is happening. It's had, to, it seems like it's had to be a big quick shift over the past year and that's happening. Um, but there, there is still this urgent need for um, pragmatic, flexible, um, locally relevant approaches and, and making sure that the aid sector really focuses on that. So that does include, you know, thinking of who has the comparative advantage on the ground and how can we be smart about making the best use of those, those local actors. So for me, it's been actually quite, um, I think one of the comments said, oh, we, we sound a bit um, negative, but in fact, I'm quite optimistic, especially hearing some of these, uh, these comments about the approaches that are underway, because it, it, it seems like um, there's been a lot of learning quickly and also just um, attempts to really shift um, the way that we work in these in settings like Afghanistan. So for me, this was quite optimistic. I think I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Elisa. Thank you, uh, Dr. Neymar. Thank you, um, um, Sir Thomas, Connie, Melinda, for your excellent contribution to today's conversation. We have uh, quite lots of questions, to be very honest, and I was looking at it and I uh, truly didn't know how to respond to all our participants, but I think it expresses to say how uh, interesting this conversation was, and as we said uh, initially, how timely this conversation is. But definitely in a in a very difficult and complex uh, space and environment, because on one hand, we do want to address the humanitarian crises on the ground. And I think, Melinda, you um, said it really well uh, in terms of the figures, in terms of uh, the dire situation. And Connie, you too, uh, with your colleagues on the ground and really taking this the uh, biggest, um, how do I say, um, the, the, the managing the biggest umbrella of contribution and work and uh, part of the UN as well. I think Afghanistan is probably um, the uh, largest humanitarian uh, package that the UN has given and working with uh, people in the ground. Uh, but still, we are a, in a space and uh, that the that is improvement, but it's very small and it's very minimal. And I think it contributes a lot to what we have seen. Uh, we all talked about uh, the economic situation, the private sector growth, the development, the sustainable aspect, which is uh, still pretty uh, difficult because it's it's very uh, obvious uh, functioning in a country where there are restrictions and uh, economy is not growing, uh, vice versa, there is even more contractions. And, and at the same time, we're facing um, the drought and the climate uh, crises. So contributing and putting together all this uh, is, is not really easy. But we hope we hope uh, this uh, will add to the existing conversation that exists right now among practitioners, among policymakers, and we have uh, our uh, esteemed uh, colleague, uh, the EU rep, uh, today. And I think I know him uh, how much uh, greater advocacy he has from his side on Afghanistan, and I know uh, with the type of commitment he has to the country and to the people of Afghanistan, and I'm sure he can convey some of what. Um, uh, the UN, the World Bank, and uh, Alisa, you mentioned, uh, would be conveyed back to um, higher level decision makers. And I think the great part is a contribution of funding, but uh, all this could not be achieved without uh, not having a sustainable financial system in the ground. And, and I think right now that's the biggest challenge. And to be very frank and honest, I don't think so. There is um, a solution uh, much for that uh, as of now. But uh, one thing that really comes to the core and to the heart of this, I think it is the women of Afghanistan because they bear the biggest uh, portion of the hurdle today. As women, as breadwinners, they are expected to stay at home and not work. As a young woman who aspires to be contributor to the economy, they are staying at home and denied from education. Uh, and to me, I always come to the very simple question, how any country on earth could be sustainable economically if half of its population is expected to stay at home and do nothing? Uh, and I think that comes to the richest economies of the world as well, because uh, there is uh, definitely an impossible task when 
um, half of the population do not contribute economically and the remaining half needs to work. <clears throat> and while um, that's com uh, complemented with other challenges and economic difficulties as well. So uh, with uh, my very humble uh, way, would like to express my gratitude to you all and my gratitude to our participants. I tried to take the questions as much as I could. Uh, Mr. Powell, I will reach out to you myself and answer uh, your question. And I'm very grateful to my team. And once again, uh, Lisa, for your excellent conclusion and Melinda, for your willingness to speak and be with us. Mr. Thomas, with uh, your uh, starting right away from um, your first day after uh, a little break uh, at work and coming and uh, to be available and speak with us. And Connie, I know you just arrived from a visit from a trip and uh, you made yourself available to speak to us. Uh, so uh, on behalf of the lab, the Afghanistan Policy Lab, on behalf of my fellows and on behalf of the school, Princeton University and the School of Public and International Affairs, uh, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, coming and I would be in touch. We will be in touch. Uh, I hope you also enjoyed the conversation and we will end this panel and we hope to start the series and hopefully get into more difficult and more practical and more important questions as well, like the financial uh, system. And I hope that will be our second topic to discuss. Thank you all. Thank you so much. <laughs>